Egyptians Egyptian Arabic, Masrian IPA, Ms. J. G. N., Misraian, Arabic, Misrwan Coptic, Ni, Rem, N. Kimi are an ethnic group native to Egypt and the citizens of that country sharing a common culture and a common dialect known as Egyptian Arabic. Egyptian identity is closely tied to geography. The population of Egypt is concentrated in the lower Nile Valley, the small strip of cultivable land stretching from the first cataract to the Mediterranean and enclosed by desert both to the east and to the west. This unique geography has been the basis of the development of Egyptian society since antiquity. The daily language of the Egyptians is the local variety of Arabic, known as Egyptian Arabic or Masri. Additionally, a sizable minority of Egyptians living in Upper Egypt speak Saidi Arabic. Egyptians are predominantly adherents of Sunni Islam with a Shia minority and a significant proportion who follow native Sufi orders. A considerable percentage of Egyptians belong to the Coptic Orthodox Church, whose liturgical language, Coptic, is the most recent stage of the indigenous Egyptian language and is still used in prayers along with Arabic. Terminology <inaudible> 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 Egyptians receive or have received several names Egyptians, from Greek Egyptioi, Aiguptioi, from Aegyptos, Aiguptos, Egypt. The Greek name is derived from late Egyptian Hikupta, Memphis, a corruption of the earlier Egyptian name Hat Ka Ptah, meaning, home of the Ka soul of Ptah, the name of a temple to the god Ptah at Memphis. Strabo provided a folk etymology according to which Egyptos had evolved as a compound from A. Igeu Hipsius Ageo Hupsios, meaning, below the Aegean. In English, the noun, Egyptians, appears in the 14th century, in Wycliffe's Bible, as Egyptians. Copts, cubed, keeped, cube, also a derivative of the Greek word Egyptius, Iguptios, Egyptian. That appeared under Muslim rule to refer to indigenous population of Egypt and to separate them from the Arabs. Coptic was the language of the state, church, and people, but then got replaced by Arabic after the Muslim conquest. Islam became the dominant religion in Egypt due to mass conversions from Christianity to Islam, mainly from the poor masses after being unable to regularly pay the jizya. The modern term then became exclusively associated with Egyptian Christianity and Coptic Christians who are members of the Coptic Orthodox Church or Coptic Catholic Church, though references to native Muslims as Copts are attested until the Mamluk period. Misraian, the modern Egyptian name, which comes from the ancient Semitic name for Egypt and originally connoted civilization or metropolis. Classical Arabic Misar Egyptian Arabic Mazar is directly cognate with the biblical Hebrew Mitzrayim, meaning the two straits, a reference to the predynastic separation of Upper and Lower Egypt. Edward William Lane writing in the 1820s, said that Egyptians commonly called themselves El Misraian the Egyptians, Ulad Mazar the children of Egypt and Al Mazar the people of Egypt. He added that the Turks stigmatized the Egyptians with the name Al Farun or the people of the Pharaoh. Erpt Nkm, T, the native Egyptian name of the people of the Nile Valley, literally people of Kemet i.e., Egypt. In antiquity, it was often shortened to simply Erpt or the people. The name is vocalized as rem, and key per mile, in the Boharic Coptic stage of the language, meaning Egyptian, ni, rem, and kimi, with the plural definite article, the Egyptians. Topic. Demographics There are an estimated 92.1 million Egyptians. Most are native to Egypt, where Egyptians constitute around 91% of the population. Approximately 84 to 90% of the population of Egypt are Muslim adherents and 10 to 15% are Christian adherents, 10 to 15% Coptic, 1% other Christian according to estimates. The majority live near the banks of the Nile River where the only arable land is found. Close to half of the Egyptian people today are urban, most of the rest are Fellahin that are native, along with descendants of several Arab tribes living in rural towns and villages. A large influx of Fellahin into urban cities, and rapid urbanization of many rural areas since the early 20th century, have shifted the balance between the number of urban and rural citizens. Egyptians also form smaller minorities in neighboring countries, North America, Europe and Australia. Egyptians also tend to be provincial, meaning their attachment extends not only to Egypt but to the specific provinces, towns and villages from which they hail. 
Therefore, return migrants, such as temporary workers abroad, come back to their region of origin in Egypt. According to the International Organization for Migration, an estimated 2.7 million Egyptians live abroad and contribute actively to the development of their country through remittances $7.8 billion in 2009, circulation of human and social capital, as well as investment. Approximately 70% of Egyptian migrants live in Arab countries 923,600 in Saudi Arabia, 332,600 in Libya, 226,850 in Jordan, 190,550 in Kuwait with the rest elsewhere in the region and the remaining 30% are living mostly in Europe and North America 318,000 in the United States, 110,000 in Canada and 90,000 in Italy. Their characteristic rootedness as Egyptians, commonly explained as the result of centuries as a farming people clinging to the banks of the Nile, is reflected in sights, sounds and atmosphere that are meaningful to all Egyptians. Dominating the intangible pull of Egypt is the ever-present Nile, which is more than a constant backdrop. Its varying colors and changing water levels signal the coming and going of the Nile flood that sets the rhythm of farming in a rainless country and holds the attention of all Egyptians. No Egyptian is ever far from his river and, except for the Alexandrians whose personality is split by looking outward toward the Mediterranean, the Egyptians are a hinterland people with little appetite for travel, even inside their own country. They glorify their national dishes, including the variety of concoctions surrounding the simple bean. Most of all, they have a sense of all-encompassing familiarity at home and a sense of alienation when abroad. There is something particularly excruciating about Egyptian nostalgia for Egypt, it is sometimes outlandish, but the attachment flows through all Egyptians, as the Nile through Egypt. A sizable Egyptian diaspora did not begin to form until well into the 1980s, when political and economic conditions began driving Egyptians out of the country in significant numbers. Today, the diaspora numbers nearly 4 million 2006 est. Generally, those who emigrate to the United States and Western European countries tend to do so permanently, with 93% and 55.5% of Egyptians respectively settling in the new country. On the other hand, Egyptians migrating to Arab countries almost always only go there with the intention of returning to Egypt. Virtually none settle in the new country on a permanent basis. Prior to 1974, only few Egyptian professionals had left the country in search for employment. Political, demographic and economic pressures led to the first wave of emigration after 1952. Later more Egyptians left their homeland first after the 1973 boom in oil prices and again in 1979, but it was only in the second half of the 1980s that Egyptian migration became prominent. Egyptian emigration today is motivated by even higher rates of unemployment, population growth and increasing prices. Political repression and human rights violations by Egypt's ruling regime are other contributing factors see Egypt section human rights. Egyptians have also been impacted by the wars between Egypt and Israel, particularly after the Six-Day War in 1967, when migration rates began to rise. In August 2006, Egyptians made headlines when 11 students from Mansoura University failed to show up at their American host institutions for a cultural exchange program in the hope of finding employment. Egyptians in neighboring countries face additional challenges. Over the years, abuse, exploitation and or ill treatment of Egyptian workers and professionals in the Arab states of the Persian Gulf, Iraq and Libya have been reported by the Egyptian Human Rights Organization and different media outlets. Arab nationals have in the past expressed fear over an Egyptianization of the local dialects and culture that were believed to have resulted from the predominance of Egyptians in the field of education. See also Egyptian Arabic, geographics. The Egyptians for their part object to what they call the Saudization of their culture due to Saudi Arabian petrodollar flush investment in the Egyptian entertainment industry. Twice Libya was on the brink of war with Egypt due to mistreatment of Egyptian workers and after the signing of the peace treaty with Israel. When the Gulf War ended, Egyptian workers in Iraq were subjected to harsh measures and expulsion by the Iraqi government and to violent attacks by Iraqis returning from the war to fill the workforce. Topic. Identity The degree to which Egyptians identify with each layer of Egypt's history in articulating a sense of collective identity can vary. 
Questions of identity came to fore in the 20th century as Egyptians sought to free themselves from British occupation, leading to the rise of ethno-territorial secular Egyptian nationalism also known as pharaonism. After Egyptians gained their independence from Great Britain, other forms of nationalism developed, including secular Arab nationalism as well as Islamism. Pharaonism rose to political prominence in the 1920s and 1930s during the British occupation, as Egypt developed separately from the Arab world. A segment of the most westernized upper class argued that Egypt was part of a Mediterranean civilization. This ideology largely developed out of the country's lengthy pre-Islamic pre-Arab history, the relative isolation of the Nile Valley and the mostly homogeneous indigenous non-Arab genetic ancestry, ethnicity of the inhabitants, regardless of current religious identity. One of Pharaonism's most notable advocates was Taha Hussein who remarked, "...Pharaonism is deeply rooted in the spirits of the Egyptians. It will remain so, and it must continue and become stronger." The Egyptian is pharaonic before being Arab. Pharaonism became the dominant mode of expression of Egyptian anti colonial activists of the pre war and inter war periods. In 1931, following a visit to Egypt, Syrian Arab nationalist Sati al Husri remarked that, Egyptians did not possess an Arab nationalist sentiment, did not accept that Egypt was a part of the Arab lands, and would not acknowledge that the Egyptian people were part of the Arab nation. The later 1930s would become a formative period for Arab nationalism in Egypt, in large part due to efforts by Syrian, Palestinian, and Lebanese intellectuals. Arab Islamic political sentiment was fueled by the solidarity felt between Egyptians struggling for independence from Britain and those across the Arab world engaged in similar anti imperialist struggles. In particular, the growth of Zionism in neighboring Palestine was seen as a threat by many Egyptians and the cause of resistance there was adopted by rising Islamic movements such as the Muslim Brotherhood as well as the political leadership including King Farouk I and Prime Minister Mustafa El Nahas. Nevertheless, a year after the establishment of the League of Arab States in 1945, to be headquartered in Cairo, Oxford University historian H. S. Dayton was still writing, the Egyptians are not Arabs, and both they and the Arabs are aware of this fact. They are Arabic-speaking, and they are predominantly Muslim. I indeed, the Muslim religion plays a greater part in their lives than it does in those either of the Muslim Syrians or the Iraqi Muslims. But the Egyptian, during the first 30 years of the 20th century, was not aware of any particular bond with the Arab East. Egypt sees in the Arab cause a worthy object of real and active sympathy and, at the same time, a great and proper opportunity for the exercise of leadership, as well as for the enjoyment of its fruits. But Egypt, she is still Egyptian first and Arab only in consequence, and her main interests are still domestic. It was not until the Nasser era more than a decade later that Arab nationalism, and by extension Arab socialism, became a state policy and a means with which to define Egypt's position in the Middle East and the world, usually articulated vis-a-vis -vis Zionism in the neighboring new state of Israel. Nasser's politics was shaped by his conviction that all the Arab states were contending with anti-imperialist struggles and thus solidarity between them was imperative for independence. He viewed the earlier Egyptian nationalism of Saad Zaghloul as too inward-looking and saw no conflict between Egyptian patriotism and Arab nationalism .For a while Egypt and Syria formed the United Arab Republic When the Union was dissolved, Egypt continued to be known as the UAR until 1971, when Egypt adopted the current official name, the Arab Republic of Egypt. The Egyptians' attachment to Arabism was particularly questioned after the 1967 Six-Day War. Thousands of Egyptians had lost their lives, and the country became disillusioned with Arab politics. Although the Arabism instilled in the country by Nasser was not deeply embedded in society, a certain kinship with the rest of the Arab world was firmly established and Egypt saw itself as the leader of this larger cultural entity. Nasser's version of Pan-Arabism stressed Egyptian sovereignty and leadership of Arab unity instead of the Eastern Arab states. Nasser's successor Anwar el-Sadat, both through public policy and his peace initiative with Israel, revived an uncontested Egyptian orientation, unequivocally asserting that only Egypt and Egyptians were his responsibility. According to Dawisha, the terms Arab, Arabism, and Arab unity 
save for the new official name, became conspicuously absent. See also Liberal Age and Republic sections. However, despite Sadat's systematic attempts to root out Arab sentiment, Arab nationalism in Egypt remained a potent force. During this era, in 1978, Egyptian American sociologist Saad Eddin Ibrahim studied the national discourse between 17 Egyptian intellectuals relating to Egypt's identity and peace with Israel. He noted that in 18 articles Arab identity was acknowledged and neutrality in the conflict opposed, while in 8 articles Arab identity was acknowledged and neutrality supported and only in 3 articles written by author Louis Awad was Arab identity rejected and neutrality supported. Egyptian scholar Gamal Hamdan stressed that Egyptian identity was unique, but that Egypt was the center and cultural hub of the Arab world, arguing that Egypt in the Arab world is like Cairo in Egypt. Hamdan further contended, "...we do not see the Egyptian personality, no matter how distinct it may be, as anything other than a part of the personality of the greater Arab homeland." Many Egyptians today feel that Egyptian and Arab identities are inextricably linked, and emphasize the central role that Egypt plays in the Arab world. Others continue to believe that Egypt and Egyptians are simply not Arab, emphasizing indigenous Egyptian heritage, culture and independent polity, pointing to the perceived failures of Arab and pan-Arab nationalist policies. Egyptian anthropologist Leila El Hamamzi illustrates the modern-day relationship between the two trends, stating, In light of their history, Egyptians should be conscious of their national identity and consider themselves, above all, Egyptians. How is the Egyptian, with this strong sense of Egyptian identity, able to look himself as an Arab too? Her explanation is that Egyptianization translated as Arabization with the result being, an increased tempo of Arabization, for facility in the Arabic language opened the windows into the rich legacy of Arabic culture. Thus in seeking a cultural identity, Egypt has revived its Arab cultural heritage. Egyptian critics of Arab nationalism contend that it has worked to erode and or relegate native Egyptian identity by superimposing only one aspect of Egypt's culture. These views and sources for collective identification in the Egyptian state are captured in the words of a linguistic anthropologist who conducted fieldwork in Cairo. Historically, Egyptians have considered themselves as distinct from Arabs and even at present rarely do they make that identification in casual contexts. Il Arab the Arabs as used by Egyptians refers mainly to the inhabitants of the Gulf states. Egypt has been both a leader of pan-Arabism and a site of intense resentment towards that ideology. Egyptians had to be made, often forcefully, into Arabs during the Nasser era because they did not historically identify themselves as such. Egypt was self-consciously a nation not only before pan-Arabism but also before becoming a colony of the British Empire. Its territorial continuity since ancient times, its unique history as exemplified in its pharaonic past and later on its Coptic language and culture, had already made Egypt into a nation for centuries. Egyptians saw themselves, their history, culture and language as specifically Egyptian and not Arab. Languages In the early dynastic period, Egyptians spoke the archaic Egyptian language. In antiquity, Egyptians spoke the Egyptian language. It constitutes its own branch of the Afroasiatic family. The Coptic language is the direct descendant of the Egyptian language, written in Coptic alphabet. Arabic was adopted by the rulers of Egypt after the Arab invasion and gradually came to replace Coptic as the spoken language. Spoken Coptic was mostly extinct by the 17th century but may have survived in isolated pockets in Upper Egypt as late as the 19th century. The official language of Egypt today is Arabic. The spoken vernacular is known as Egyptian Arabic, while modern Standard Arabic is reserved for more formal contexts, as is the case in all Arab countries. The recorded history of Egyptian Arabic as a separate dialect begins in Ottoman Egypt with a document by a 17th-century author writing about the peculiarities of the speech of the Egyptian people. This suggests that the language by then was spoken by the majority of Egyptians. It is represented in a body of vernacular literature comprising novels, plays and poetry published over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. Classical Arabic is also a significant cultural element in Egyptian culture, as Egyptian novelists and poets were among the first to experiment with modern styles of Arabic literature, and the forms they developed have been widely imitated. 
While a huge majority of the Egyptian Arabic dialect is derived from the formal Arabic language, it has also been highly influenced by many other languages such as French, Turkish and the Old Egyptian language. This is widely thought to be the effects of being the victim of several invasions, including that of the Ottoman Empire as well as the French invasion. As each nation came and went, the Egyptians kept the few words and phrases that made the language seem easier. It is also noteworthy that the Egyptian dialect is the most understood version of the Arabic language amongst the Arab world. This is because Egyptian movies have been the most influential in the Arabic movie industry and is therefore the most widespread. As a result, most Arabic countries have grown up listening to the dialect and therefore have no trouble understanding it, even though they actually speak their own. Originally the Egyptians wrote in hieroglyphics. At first the meaning of the hieroglyphics was unknown, until one day in the year 1799 Napoleon Bonaparte's soldiers dug up the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was found broken and incomplete. It features 14 lines of hieroglyphic script, 32 lines in Demotic and 53 lines of Ancient Greek. History Ancient Egypt Ancient Egypt saw a succession of 30 dynasties spanning three millennia. During this period, Egyptian culture underwent significant development in terms of religion, arts, language and customs. Egypt fell under Hyksos rule in the Middle Bronze Age. The native nobility managed to expel the conquerors by the Late Bronze Age, thereby initiating the New Kingdom. During this period, the Egyptian civilization rose to the status of an empire under Pharaoh Thutmose III of the 18th dynasty. It remained a super-regional power throughout the Amarna period as well as during the 19th and 20th dynasties the Ramesside period, lasting into the early Iron Age. The Bronze Age collapse that had afflicted the Mesopotamian empires reached Egypt with some delay, and it was only in the 11th century BC that the empire declined, falling into the comparative obscurity of the Third Intermediate Period of Egypt. The 25th dynasty of Nubian rulers was again briefly replaced by native nobility in the 7th century BC, and in 525 BC, Egypt fell under Persian rule. Alexander the Great was greeted as a liberator when he conquered Egypt in 332 BC. The late period of ancient Egypt is taken to end with his death in 323 BC. The Ptolemaic dynasty ruled Egypt from 305 BC to 30 BC and introduced Hellenic culture to Egyptians. 4,000 Celtic mercenaries under Ptolemy II had even attempted an ambitious but doomed coup d'état around the year 270 BC. Throughout the Pharaonic epoch viz., from 2920 BC to 525 BC in conventional Egyptian chronology, divine kingship was the glue which held Egyptian society together. It was especially pronounced in the Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom and continued until the Roman conquest. The societal structure created by this system of government remained virtually unchanged up to modern times. The role of the king was considerably weakened after the 20th dynasty. The king in his role as son of Ra was entrusted to maintain Mat, the principle of truth, justice and order, and to enhance the country's agricultural economy by ensuring regular Nile floods. Ascendancy to the Egyptian throne reflected the myth of Horus who assumed kingship after he buried his murdered father Osiris. The king of Egypt, as a living personification of Horus, could claim the throne after burying his predecessor, who was typically his father. When the role of the king waned, the country became more susceptible to foreign influence and invasion. The attention paid to the dead, and the veneration with which they were held, were one of the hallmarks of ancient Egyptian society. Egyptians built tombs for their dead that were meant to last for eternity. This was most prominently expressed by the Great Pyramids. The ancient Egyptian word for tomb pr, means house of eternity. The Egyptians also celebrated life, as is shown by tomb reliefs and inscriptions, papyri and other sources depicting Egyptians farming, conducting trade expeditions, hunting, holding festivals, attending parties and receptions with their pet dogs, cats and monkeys, dancing and singing, enjoying food and drink, and playing games. The ancient Egyptians were also known for their engaging sense of humor, much like their modern descendants. Another important continuity during this period is the Egyptian attitude toward foreigners—those they considered not fortunate enough to be part of the community of Erpt or the people. 
i.e., Egyptians. This attitude was facilitated by the Egyptians' more frequent contact with other peoples during the New Kingdom, when Egypt expanded to an empire that also encompassed Nubia through Jebel Barkal and parts of the Levant. The Egyptian sense of superiority was given religious validation, as foreigners in the land of Ta Mary Egypt were anathema to the maintenance of Mayat a view most clearly expressed by the admonitions of Apuwar in reaction to the chaotic events of the Second Intermediate Period. Foreigners in Egyptian texts were described in derogatory terms, e.g., wretched Asiatics Semites, vile Cushites Nubians, and Ionian dogs Greeks. Egyptian beliefs remained unchallenged when Egypt fell to the Hyksos, Assyrians, Libyans, Persians and Greeks—their rulers assumed the role of the Egyptian pharaoh and were often depicted praying to Egyptian gods. The ancient Egyptians used a solar calendar that divided the year into twelve months of thirty days each, with five extra days added. The calendar revolved around the annual Nile inundation the first of three seasons into which the year was divided. The other two were winter and summer, each lasting for four months. The modern Egyptian fellahin calculate the agricultural seasons, with the months still bearing their ancient names, in much the same manner. The importance of the Nile in Egyptian life, ancient and modern, cannot be overemphasized. The rich alluvium carried by the Nile inundation were the basis of Egypt's formation as a society and a state. Regular inundations were a cause for celebration, low waters often meant famine and starvation. The ancient Egyptians personified the river flood as the god Hapi and dedicated a hymn to the Nile to celebrate it. Kmt, the Black Land, was as Herodotus observed, the gift of the river. Greco-Roman period When Alexander died, a story began to circulate that Nectanebo II was Alexander's father. This made Alexander in the eyes of the Egyptians a legitimate heir to the native pharaohs. The new Ptolemaic rulers, however, exploited Egypt for their own benefit and a great social divide was created between Egyptians and Greeks. The local priesthood continued to wield power as they had during the dynastic age. Egyptians continued to practice their religion undisturbed and largely maintained their own separate communities from their foreign conquerors. The language of administration became Greek, but the mass of the Egyptian population was Egyptian-speaking and concentrated in the countryside. While most Greeks lived in Alexandria and only few had any knowledge of Egyptian, the Ptolemaic rulers all retained their Greek names and titles, but projected a public image of being Egyptian pharaohs. Much of this period's vernacular literature was composed in the demotic phase and script of the Egyptian language. It was focused on earlier stages of Egyptian history when Egyptians were independent and ruled by great native pharaohs such as Ramesses II. Prophetic writings circulated among Egyptians promising expulsion of the Greeks, and frequent revolts by the Egyptians took place throughout the Ptolemaic period. A revival in animal cults, the hallmark of the predynastic and early dynastic periods, is said to have come about to fill a spiritual void as Egyptians became increasingly disillusioned and weary due to successive waves of foreign invasions. When the Romans annexed Egypt in 30 BC, the social structure created by the Greeks was largely retained, though the power of the Egyptian priesthood diminished. The Roman emperors lived abroad and did not perform the ceremonial functions of Egyptian kingship as the Ptolemies had. The art of mummy portraiture flourished, but Egypt became further stratified with Romans at the apex of the social pyramid. Greeks and Jews occupied the middle stratum, while Egyptians, who constituted the vast majority, were at the bottom. Egyptians paid a poll tax at full rate, Greeks paid at half rate, and Roman citizens were exempt. The Roman emperor Caracalla advocated the expulsion of all ethnic Egyptians from the city of Alexandria, saying, Genuine Egyptians can easily be recognized among the linen weavers by their speech. This attitude lasted until AD 212 when Roman citizenship was finally granted to all the inhabitants of Egypt, though ethnic divisions remained largely entrenched. The Romans, like the Ptolemies, treated Egypt like their own private property, a land exploited for the benefit of a small foreign elite. The Egyptian peasants, pressed for maximum production to meet Roman quotas, suffered and fled to the desert. The cult of Isis, like those of Osiris and Serapis, had been popular in Egypt and throughout the Roman Empire at the coming of Christianity, and continued to be the main competitor with Christianity in its early years. The main temple of Isis remained a major center of worship in Egypt until the reign of the Byzantine emperor Justinian I in the 6th century, when it was finally closed down. 
Egyptians, disaffected and weary after a series of foreign occupations, identified the story of the mother goddess Isis protecting her child Horus with that of the Virgin Mary and her son Jesus escaping the Emperor Herod. Consequently, many sites believed to have been the resting places of the Holy Family during their sojourn in Egypt became sacred to the Egyptians. The visit of the Holy Family later circulated among Egyptian Christians as fulfillment of the biblical prophecy. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and called my son out of Egypt." Hosea 11 verse 1. The Feast of the Coming of the Lord of Egypt on June 1 became an important part of Christian Egyptian tradition. According to tradition, Christianity was brought to Egypt by Saint Mark the Evangelist in the early 40s of the first century, under the reign of the Roman Emperor Nero. The earliest converts were Jews residing in Alexandria, a city which had by then become a center of culture and learning in the entire Mediterranean Oikumene. Saint Mark is said to have founded the Holy Apostolic See of Alexandria and to have become its first patriarch. Within fifty years of Saint Mark's arrival in Alexandria, a fragment of New Testament writings appeared in Oxyrhynchus Banasa, which suggests that Christianity already began to spread south of Alexandria at an early date. By the mid-3rd century, a sizable number of Egyptians were persecuted by the Romans on account of having adopted the new Christian faith, beginning with the Edict of Decius. Christianity was tolerated in the Roman Empire until AD 284, when the Emperor Diocletian persecuted and put to death a great number of Christian Egyptians. This event became a watershed in the history of Egyptian Christianity, marking the beginning of a distinct Egyptian or Coptic church. It became known as the Era of the Martyrs and is commemorated in the Coptic calendar in which dating of the years began with the start of Diocletian's reign. When Egyptians were persecuted by Diocletian, many retreated to the desert to seek relief. The practice precipitated the rise of monasticism, for which the Egyptians, namely Saint Antony, Saint Bacchum, Saint Shinoda and Saint Amun, are credited as pioneers. By the end of the 4th century, it is estimated that the mass of the Egyptians had either embraced Christianity or were nominally Christian. The Catechetical School of Alexandria was founded in the 3rd century by Pantinus, becoming a major school of Christian learning as well as science, mathematics, and the humanities. The Psalms and part of the New Testament were translated at the school from Greek to Egyptian, which had already begun to be written in Greek letters with the addition of a number of demotic characters. This stage of the Egyptian language would later come to be known as Coptic along with its alphabet. The third theologian to head the catechetical school was a native Egyptian by the name of Origen. Origen was an outstanding theologian and one of the most influential church fathers. He traveled extensively to lecture in various churches around the world and has many important texts to his credit including the Hexapla, an exegesis of various translations of the Hebrew Bible. At the threshold of the Byzantine period, the New Testament had been entirely translated into Coptic. But while Christianity continued to thrive in Egypt, the old pagan beliefs which had survived the test of time were facing mounting pressure. The Byzantine period was particularly brutal in its zeal to erase any traces of ancient Egyptian religion. Under Emperor Theodosius I, Christianity had already been proclaimed the religion of the empire and all pagan cults were forbidden. When Egypt fell under the jurisdiction of Constantinople after the split of the Roman Empire, many ancient Egyptians' temples were either destroyed or converted into monasteries. One of the defining moments in the history of the Church in Egypt is a controversy that ensued over the nature of Jesus Christ, which culminated in the final split of the Coptic Church from both the Byzantine and Roman Catholic Churches. The Council of Chalcedon convened in AD 451, signaling the Byzantine Empire's determination to assert its hegemony over Egypt. When it declared that Jesus Christ was of two natures embodied in Christ's person, the Egyptian reaction was swift, rejecting the decrees of the council as incompatible with the Myophysite doctrine of Coptic orthodoxy. The Copts' upholding of the Myophysite doctrine against the pro-Chalcedonian Greek Melkites had both theological and national implications. As Coptologist Jill Camille notes, the position taken by the Egyptians paved the way for the Coptic Church to establish itself as a separate entity no longer even spiritually linked with Constantinople, theologians began to write more in Coptic and less in Greek. Coptic art developed its own national character, and the Copts stood united against the imperial power. <laughs> Islamic period from late antiquity to Middle Ages 
Before the Muslim conquest of Egypt, the Byzantine emperor Heraclius was able to reclaim the country after a brief Persian invasion in AD 616, and subsequently appointed Cyrus of Alexandria, a Chalcedonian, as patriarch. Cyrus was determined to convert the Egyptian Myophysites by any means. He expelled Coptic monks and bishops from their monasteries and sees. Many died in the chaos, and the resentment of the Egyptians against their Byzantine conquerors reached a peak. Meanwhile, the new religion of Islam was making headway in Arabia, culminating in the Muslim conquests that took place following Muhammad's passing on. In AD 639, the Arab general Amr ibn al as marched into Egypt, facing off with the Byzantines in the Battle of Heliopolis that ended with the Byzantines' defeat. The relationship between the Greek Melkites and the Egyptian Copts had grown so bitter that most Egyptians did not put up heavy resistance against the Arabs. The new Muslim rulers moved the capital to Fustat and, through the 7th century, retained the existing Byzantine administrative structure with Greek as its language. Native Egyptians filled administrative ranks and continued to worship freely so long as they paid the jizya poll tax, in addition to a land tax that all Egyptians irrespective of religion also had to pay. The authority of the Myophysite doctrine of the Coptic Church was for the first time nationally recognized. According to al Yaqubi, repeated revolts by Egyptian Christians against the Muslim Arabs took place in the 8th and 9th centuries under the reign of the Umayyads and Abbasids. The greatest was one in which disaffected Muslim Egyptians joined their Christian compatriots around AD 830 in an unsuccessful attempt to repel the Arabs. The Egyptian Muslim historian Ibn Abd al Hakam spoke harshly of the Abbasids. A reaction that according to Egyptologist Okasha el Daly can be seen, "...within the context of the struggle between proud native Egyptians and the central Abbasid Caliphate in Iraq." The form of Islam that eventually took hold in Egypt was Sunni, though very early in this period Egyptians began to blend their new faith with indigenous beliefs and practices that had survived through Coptic Christianity. Just as Egyptians had been pioneers in early monasticism so they were in the development of the mystical form of Islam, Sufism. Various Sufi orders were founded in the 8th century and flourished until the present day. One of the earliest Egyptian Sufis was Dhul Nun al-Misri i.e., Dhul Nun the Egyptian. He was born in Akhmam in AD 796 and achieved political and social leadership over the Egyptian people. Dhul Nun was regarded as the patron saint of the physicians and is credited with having introduced the concept of Gnosis into Islam, as well as of being able to decipher a number of hieroglyphic characters due to his knowledge of Coptic. He was keenly interested in ancient Egyptian sciences, and claimed to have received his knowledge of alchemy from Egyptian sources. In the years to follow the Arab occupation of Egypt, a social hierarchy was created whereby Egyptians who converted to Islam acquired the status of mawali or clients to the ruling Arab elite, while those who remained Christian, the Copts, became dhimmis. In time the power of the Arabs waned throughout the Islamic empire so that in the 10th century, the Turkish Ikhshids were able to take control of Egypt and made it an independent political unit from the rest of the empire. Egyptians continued to live socially and politically separate from their foreign conquerors, but their rulers like the Ptolemies before them were able to stabilize the country and bring renewed economic prosperity. It was under the Shiite Fatimids from the 10th to the 12th centuries that Muslim Egyptian institutions began to take form along with the Egyptian dialect of Arabic, which was to eventually slowly supplant native Egyptian or Coptic as the spoken language. Al-Azhar was founded in AD 970 in the new capital Cairo, not very far from its ancient predecessor in Memphis. It became the preeminent Muslim center of learning in Egypt and by the Ayyubid period it had acquired a Sunni orientation. The Fatimids with some exceptions were known for their religious tolerance and their observance of local Muslim, Coptic and indigenous Egyptian festivals and customs. Under the Ayyubids, the country for the most part continued to prosper, the Mamluks of Egypt AD 1258-1517 as a whole were, some of the most enlightened rulers of Egypt, not only in the arts and in providing for the welfare of their subjects, but also in many other ways, such as efficient organization of law and order and postal services, and the building of canals, roads, bridges and aqueducts. Though turbulent, often treacherous and brutal in their feuds, and politically and economically inept, the later Mamluks maintained the splendor and artistic traditions of their predecessors. The reign of Kate Bay (1468–1496) was one of high achievement in architecture, showing great refinement of taste in the building of elegant tombs, mosques, and palaces. It was a period in which learning flourished. 
Their rule is generally regarded as one under which Egyptians, Muslims and Copts, greatly suffered. By the 15th century most Egyptians had already been converted to Islam, while Coptic Christians were reduced to a minority. The Mamluks were mainly ethnic Circassians and Turks who had been captured as slaves then recruited into the army fighting on behalf of the Islamic Empire. Native Egyptians were not allowed to serve in the army until the reign of Muhammad Ali. Historian James Jankowski writes, ultimately, Mamluk rule rested on force. The chronicles of the period are replete with examples of Mamluk violence against the indigenous population of Egypt. From horseback, they simply terrorized those lesser breeds who crossed their paths. The sudden and arbitrary use of force by the government and its dominant military elite, frequent resort to cruelty to make a point, ingenious methods of torture employed both for exemplary purpose and to extract wealth from others, all these measures were routine in the Mamluk era. Egypt under the Mamluks was not a very secure place to live. Topic. Ottoman period Egyptians under the Ottoman Turks from the 16th to the 18th centuries lived within a social hierarchy similar to that of the Mamluks, Arabs, Romans, Greeks and Persians before them. Native Egyptians applied the term attract Turks indiscriminately to the Ottomans and Mamluks, who were at the top of the social pyramid, while Egyptians, most of whom were farmers, were at the bottom. Frequent revolts by the Egyptian peasantry against the Ottoman Mamluk base took place throughout the 18th century, particularly in Upper Egypt, where the peasants at one point wrested control of the region and declared a separatist government. The only segment of Egyptian society which appears to have retained a degree of power during this period were the Muslim ulama or religious scholars, who directed the religious and social affairs of the native Egyptian population and interceded on their behalf when dealing with the Turco Circassian elite. It is also believed that during the time of Ottoman period of Egypt, native Egyptians were allowed and required to join the army for the first time since the Roman period of Egypt, particularly Copts who were civil servants at the time of Muhammad Ali Pasha. From the Egyptian side, literary works from both the Mamluk and Ottoman eras indicate that literate Egyptians had not totally submerged their identity within Islam, but retained an awareness of Egypt's distinctiveness as a uniquely fertile region of the Muslim world, as a land of great historical antiquity and splendor. At least for some Egyptians, the land of Egypt al al was an identifiable and emotionally meaningful entity within the larger Muslim polity of which it was now a province. Modern history Modern Egyptian history is generally believed to begin with the French expedition in Egypt led by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1798. The French defeated a Mamluk Ottoman army at the Battle of the Pyramids, and soon they were able to seize control of the country. The French occupation was short-lived, ending when British troops drove out the French in 1801. Its impact on the social and cultural fabric of Egyptian society, however, was tremendous. The Egyptians were deeply hostile to the French, whom they viewed as yet another foreign occupation to be resisted. At the same time, the French expedition introduced Egyptians to the ideals of the French Revolution which were to have a significant influence on their own self-perception and realization of modern independence. When Napoleon invited the Egyptian ulama to head a French supervised government in Egypt, for some, it awakened a sense of nationalism and a patriotic desire for national independence from the Turks. In addition, the French introduced the printing press in Egypt and published its first newspaper. The monumental catalogue of Egypt's ecology, society and economy, Description de l'Egypte, was written by scholars and scientists who accompanied the French army on their expedition. The withdrawal of French forces from Egypt left a power vacuum that was filled after a period of political turmoil by Muhammad Ali, an Ottoman officer of Albanian ethnicity. He rallied support among the Egyptians until he was elected by the native Muslim ulama as governor of Egypt. Muhammad Ali is credited for having undertaken a massive campaign of public works, including irrigation projects, agricultural reforms and the cultivation of cash crops notably cotton, rice and sugar cane, increased industrialization, and a new educational system, the results of which are felt to this day. In order to consolidate his power in Egypt, Muhammad Ali worked to eliminate the Turco-Circassian domination of administrative and army posts. For the first time since the Roman period, native Egyptians filled the junior ranks of the country's army. The army would later conduct military expeditions in the Levant, Sudan and against the Wahhabis in Arabia. 
Many Egyptian student missions were sent to Europe in the early 19th century to study at European universities and acquire technical skills such as printing, shipbuilding and modern military techniques. One of these students, whose name was Rifa et Tatawi, was the first in a long line of intellectuals that started the modern Egyptian Renaissance. Nationalism The period between 1860–1940 was characterized by an Egyptian nada, renaissance or rebirth. It is best known for the renewed interest in Egyptian antiquity and the cultural achievements that were inspired by it. Along with this interest came an indigenous, Egypt-centered orientation, particularly among the Egyptian intelligentsia that would affect Egypt's autonomous development as a sovereign and independent nation-state. The first Egyptian Renaissance intellectual was Rifa el Tatawi. In 1831, Tatawi undertook a career in journalism, education and translation. Three of his published volumes were works of political and moral philosophy. In them he introduces his students to Enlightenment ideas such as secular authority and political rights and liberty, his ideas regarding how a modern civilized society ought to be and what constituted by extension a civilized or good Egyptian and his ideas on public interest and public good, Tatawi was instrumental in sparking indigenous interest in Egypt's ancient heritage. He composed a number of poems in praise of Egypt and wrote two other general histories of the country. He also co-founded with his contemporary Ali Mubarak, the architect of the modern Egyptian school system, a native Egyptology school that looked for inspiration to medieval Egyptian scholars like Suyuti and Makrizi, who studied ancient Egyptian history, language and antiquities. Tatawi encouraged his compatriots to invite Europeans to come and teach the modern sciences in Egypt, drawing on the example of Pharaoh Samtek I who had enlisted the Greeks' help in organizing the Egyptian army. Among Muhammad Ali's successors, the most influential was Ismail Pasha who became Khedive in 1863. Ismail's reign witnessed the growth of the army, major education reforms, the founding of the Egyptian Museum and the Royal Opera House, the rise of an independent political press, a flourishing of the arts, and the inauguration of the Suez Canal. In 1866, the Assembly of Delegates was founded to serve as an advisory body for the government. Its members were elected from across Egypt, including villages, which meant that native Egyptians came to exert increasing political and economic influence over their country. Several generations of Egyptians exposed to the ideas of constitutionalism made up the emerging intellectual and political milieu that slowly filled the ranks of the government, the army and institutions which had long been dominated by an aristocracy of Turks, Greeks, Circassians and Armenians. Ismail's massive modernization campaign, however, left Egypt indebted to European powers, leading to increased European meddling in local affairs. This led to the formation of secret groups made up of Egyptian notables, ministers, journalists and army officers organized across the country to oppose the increasing European influence. When the British deposed of Ismail and installed his son Tafik, the now Egyptian-dominated army reacted violently, staging a revolt led by Minister of War Ahmed Arabi, self-styled El Masri, the Egyptian against the Khedive, the Turco-Circassian elite and the European stronghold. The revolt was a military failure and British forces occupied Egypt in 1882. Technically, Egypt was still part of the Ottoman Empire with the Muhammad Ali family ruling the country, though now with British supervision and according to British directives. The Egyptian army was disbanded and a smaller army commanded by British officers was installed in its place. Topic. Liberal age Egyptian self-government, education, and the continued plight of Egypt's peasant majority deteriorated most significantly under British occupation. Slowly, an organized national movement for independence began to form. In its beginnings, it took the form of an Azhar-led religious reform movement that was more concerned with the social conditions of Egyptian society. It gathered momentum between 1882 and 1906, ultimately leading to a resentment against European occupation. Sheikh Mohammed Abdu, the son of a Delta farmer who was briefly exiled for his participation in the Arabi revolt and a future Azhar Mufti, was its most notable advocate. Abdu called for a reform of Egyptian Muslim society and formulated the modernist interpretations of Islam that took hold among younger generations of Egyptians. Among these were Mustafa Kamil and Ahmed Lutfi el-Sayed, the architects of modern Egyptian nationalism. 
Mustafa Kamil had been a student activist in the 1890s involved in the creation of a secret nationalist society that called for British evacuation from Egypt. He was famous for coining the popular expression, If I had not been an Egyptian, I would have wished to become one. Egyptian nationalist sentiment reached a high point after the 1906 Dinshaway incident, when following an altercation between a group of British soldiers and Egyptian farmers, four of the farmers were hanged while others were condemned to public flogging. Dinshaway, a watershed in the history of Egyptian anti-colonial resistance, galvanized Egyptian opposition against the British, culminating in the founding of the first two political parties in Egypt, the secular, liberal Uma the Nation, 1907, headed by Ahmed Lutfi El Sayed, and the more radical, pro-Islamic Watani Party National Party, 1908, headed by Mustafa Kamil. Lutfi was born to a family of farmers in the Delta province of Dakalaya in 1872. He was educated at Al-Azhar where he attended lectures by Muhammad Abdu. Abdu came to have a profound influence on Lutfi's reformist thinking in later years. In 1907, he founded the Uma Party newspaper, El Garita, whose statement of purpose read, El Garita is a purely Egyptian party which aims to defend Egyptian interests of all kinds. Both the people and national parties came to dominate Egyptian politics until World War I, but the new leaders of the National Movement for Independence following four arduous years of war in which Great Britain declared Egypt a British protectorate were closer to the secular, liberal principles of Ahmed Lutfi El Sayed and the People's Party. Prominent among these was Saad Zaghloul who led the new movement through the WAFD party. Saad Zaghloul held several ministerial positions before he was elected to the Legislative Assembly and organised a mass movement demanding an end to the British protectorate. He garnered such massive popularity among the Egyptian people that he came to be known as «father of the Egyptians». When on March 8, 1919 the British arrested Zaghloul and his associates and exiled them to Malta, the Egyptian people staged their first modern revolution. Demonstrations and strikes across Egypt became such a daily occurrence that normal life was brought to a halt. The WAFD party drafted a new constitution in 1923 based on a parliamentary representative system. Saad Zaghloul became the first popularly elected Prime Minister of Egypt in 1924. Egyptian independence at this stage was provisional, as British forces continued to be physically present on Egyptian soil. In 1936, the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty was concluded. New forces that came to prominence were the Muslim Brotherhood and the Radical Young Egypt Party. In 1920, Bank Misr Bank of Egypt was founded by Talat Pasha Harb as an Egyptian bank for Egyptians only, which restricted shareholding to native Egyptians and helped finance various new Egyptian-owned businesses. Under the parliamentary monarchy, Egypt reached the peak of its modern intellectual renaissance that was started by Rifa el Tadawi nearly a century earlier. Among those who set the intellectual tone of a newly independent Egypt, in addition to Muhammad Abdu and Ahmed Lutfi el Sayed, were Qasim Amin, Muhammad Hussein Haikal, Taha Hussein, Abbas el Akkad, Tafik el Hakim, and Salama Musa. They delineated a liberal outlook for their country expressed as a commitment to individual freedom, secularism, an evolutionary view of the world and faith in science to bring progress to human society. This period was looked upon with fondness by future generations of Egyptians as a golden age of Egyptian liberalism, openness, and an Egypt-centered attitude that put the country's interests center stage. When Egyptian novelist and Nobel Prize laureate Naguib Mahfouz died in 2006, many Egyptians felt that perhaps the last of the greats of Egypt's Golden Age had died. In his dialogues with close associate and journalist Mohamed Salmai, published as Mon Egypta, Mahfouz had this to say, Egypt is not just a piece of land. Egypt is the inventor of civilization. The strange thing is that this country of great history and unsurpassed civilization is nothing but a thin strip along the banks of the Nile. This thin strip of land created moral values, launched the concept of monotheism, developed arts, invented science and gave the world a stunning administration. These factors enabled the Egyptians to survive while other cultures and nations withered and died. Throughout history Egyptians have felt that their mission is to tend to life. They were proud to turn the land green, to make it blossom with life. 
The other thing is that Egyptians invented morality long before the major religions appeared on earth. Morality is not just a system for control but a protection against chaos and death. Egypt gave Islam a new voice. It didn't change the basic tenets of Islam, but its cultural weight gave Islam a new voice, one it didn't have back in Arabia. Egypt embraced an Islam that was moderate, tolerant and non-extremist. Egyptians are very pious, but they know how to mix piety with joy, just as their ancestors did centuries ago. Egyptians celebrate religious occasions with flair. For them, religious festivals in the month of Ramadan are occasions to celebrate life. Topic. Republic Increased involvement by King Farouk in parliamentary affairs, government corruption, and the widening gap between the country's rich and poor led to the eventual toppling of the monarchy and the dissolution of the parliament through a coup d'état by a group of army officers in 1952. The Egyptian Republic was declared on June 18, 1953 with General Mohamed Naguib as the first president of the republic. After Naguib was forced to resign in 1954 and later put under house arrest by Gamal Abdel Nasser, the real architect of the 1952 movement, mass protests by Egyptians erupted against the forced resignation of what became a popular symbol of the new regime. Nasser assumed power as president and began a nationalization process that initially had profound effects on the socio economic strata of Egyptian society. According to one historian, Egypt had, for the first time since 343 BC, been ruled not by a Macedonian Greek, nor a Roman, nor an Arab, nor a Turk, but by an Egyptian." Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal leading to the 1956 Suez Crisis. Egypt became increasingly involved in regional affairs until three years after the 1967 Six-Day War, in which Egypt lost the Sinai to Israel, Nasser died and was succeeded by Anwar Sadat. Sadat revived an Egypt above all orientation, switched Egypt's Cold War allegiance from the Soviet Union to the United States, expelling Soviet advisors in 1972, and launched the Infida economic reform policy. Like his predecessor, he also clamped down on religious and leftist opposition alike. Egyptians fought one last time in the 1973 October War in an attempt to liberate Egyptian territories captured by Israel six years earlier. The October War presented Sadat with a political victory that later allowed him to regain the Sinai. In 1977, Sadat made a historic visit to Israel leading to the signing of the 1978 peace treaty, which was supported by the vast majority of Egyptians, in exchange for the complete Israeli withdrawal from Sinai. Sadat was assassinated in Cairo by members of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad in 1981, and was succeeded by Hosni Mubarak. Hosni Mubarak was the president from 14 October 1981 to of February 2011, when he resigned under pressure of popular protest. Although power was ostensibly organized under a multi-party semi-presidential system, in practice it rested almost solely with the president. In late February 2005, for the first time since the 1952 coup d'état, the Egyptian people had an apparent chance to elect a leader from a list of various candidates, most prominently Ayman Noor. Most Egyptians were skeptical about the process of democratization and feared that power might ultimately be transferred to the president's first son, Gamal Mubarak. In 2003, the Egyptian Movement for Change or simply Kefaya Arabic for enough was founded as a grassroots mobilization of Egyptians seeking a return to democracy, a transparent government and greater equality and freedom. After the resignation of Hosni Mubarak presidential powers were transferred to the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, who relinquished power on 30 June 2012 when Mohamed Morsi became the first democratically elected head of state in Egyptian history. He was ousted in a revolution a year after and is on trial. In the presidential elections on 26 to 28 May 2014, Abdel Fattah El Sisi won in a landslide, capturing 22 million of the nearly 23 million votes counted. Topic: Culture. Egyptian culture boasts five millennia of recorded history. Ancient Egypt was among the earliest and greatest civilizations during which the Egyptians maintained a strikingly complex and stable culture that influenced later cultures of Europe, the Near East and Africa. After the Pharaonic era, the Egyptians themselves came under the influence of Hellenism, Christianity and Islamic culture. 
Today, many aspects of ancient Egyptian culture exist in interaction with newer elements, including the influence of modern Western culture, itself influenced by ancient Egypt. Topic. Surnames Today, Egyptians carry names that have Egyptian, Arabic, Turkish, and Greek origins especially Coptic ones, among others. The concept of a surname is lacking in Egypt. Rather, Egyptians tend to carry their father's name as their first middle name, and stop at the second or third first name, which thus becomes one's surname. In this manner, surnames continuously change with generations, as first names of fourth or fifth generations get dropped. It is not entirely unusual for families of Egyptian origin especially Coptic ones to have names or family names beginning with the Egyptian masculine possessive pronoun pa generally ba in Arabic, which lost the phoneme p in the course of developing from Proto-Semitic. For example, Baomi variations, Baomi, Baomi, Bayumi, of Fayum, Fayum meaning of the big water yam basuni of aswan bashandi bakum the eagle beket bahor of horus and banub of anubis the name shinoda which is very common among copts means child of god hence names and many toponyms may end with noda nudi or nudi which means of god in egyptian and coptic in addition, Egyptian families often derive their name from places in Egypt, such as Minyawi from Minya and Suyuti from Asayat, or from one of the local Sufi orders such as El Shazli and El Sa'i. More examples of prominent surnames are Kosman and Habib. With the adoption of Christianity and eventually Islam, Egyptians began to take on names associated with these religions. Many Egyptian surnames also became Hellenized and Arabized, meaning they were altered to sound Greek or Arabic. This was done by the addition of the Greek suffix ios to Egyptian names, for example, pakhom to pakhomios, or by adding the Arabic definite article l to names such as baymaui to el baomi. Names starting with the Egyptian affix pu, of the place of, were sometimes Arabized to abu, father of, for example, busiri, of the place of Osiris, occasionally became abusir and al busiri. Some people might also have surnames like el shami, the Levantine indicating a possible Levantine origin, or Dewitter indicating an Ottoman Mamluk remnant. Conversely, some Levantines might carry the surname El Masri, the Egyptian, suggesting a possible Egyptian extraction. The Egyptian peasantry, the Felahin, are more likely to retain indigenous names given their relative isolation throughout the Egyptian people's history. With French influence, names like Monier, Pierre, and many others became common, particularly in the Christian community. Topic. Genetic history Beginning in the predynastic period, some differences between the populations of Upper and Lower Egypt were ascertained through their skeletal remains, suggesting a gradual clinal pattern north to south. When Lower and Upper Egypt were unified c. 3200 BC, the distinction began to blur, resulting in a more homogeneous population in Egypt, though the distinction remains true to some degree to this day. Some biological anthropologists such as Shomar Kakeda believe the range of variability to be primarily indigenous and not necessarily the result of significant intermingling of widely divergent peoples. Kata describes the northern and southern patterns of the early predynastic period as Northern Egyptian Maghreb and Tropical African variant, overlapping with Nubia, Kush, respectively. He shows that a progressive change in Upper Egypt toward the Northern Egyptian pattern takes place through the predynastic period. The Southern pattern continues to predominate in Abydos, Upper Egypt by the First Dynasty, but Lower Egyptian, Maghrebian, and European patterns are observed also, thus making for great diversity. A group of noted physical anthropologists conducted craniofacial studies of Egyptian skeletal remains and concluded similarly that the Egyptians have been in place since back in the Pleistocene and have been largely unaffected by either invasions or migrations. As others have noted, Egyptians are Egyptians, and they were so in the past as well. Genetic analysis of modern Egyptians reveals that they have paternal lineages common to indigenous northeast African populations primarily and to Near Eastern peoples to a lesser extent. 
These lineages would have spread during the Neolithic and were maintained by the predynastic period. University of Chicago Egyptologist Frank Yurko suggested a historical, regional, and ethnolinguistic continuity, asserting that the mummies and skeletons of ancient Egyptians indicate they were Africans of the Afro-Asiatic ethnic grouping. He writes. Certainly there was some foreign admixture in Egypt, but basically a homogeneous African population had lived in the Nile Valley from ancient to modern times. The Badarian people, who developed the earliest pre-dynastic Egyptian culture, already exhibited the mix of North African and Sub-Saharan physical traits that have typified Egyptians ever since Hassan 1985, Yurko 1989, Trigger 1978, Keita 1990, Brace et al., this volume. The peoples of Egypt, the Sudan, and much of East Africa, Ethiopia and Somalia are now generally regarded as a Nile Valley continuity, with widely ranging physical features complexions light to dark, various hair and craniofacial types but with powerful common cultural traits, including cattle pastoralist traditions Trigger 1978, Bard, Snowden, this volume. Language research suggests that this Saharan Nile Valley population became speakers of the Afro-Asiatic languages. Semitic was evidently spoken by Saharans who crossed the Red Sea into Arabia and became ancestors of the Semitic speakers there, possibly around 7000 BC. In summary we may say that Egypt was a distinct Afro-Asiatic African culture rooted in the Nile Valley and on the Sahara. A 2006 bioarchaeological study on the dental morphology of ancient Egyptians by Prof. Joel Irish shows dental traits characteristic of indigenous North Africans and to a lesser extent Southwest Asian and Southern European populations. Among the samples included in the study is skeletal material from the Hawara tombs of Fayum, which clustered very closely with the Badarian series of the pre-dynastic period. All the samples, particularly those of the dynastic period, were significantly divergent from a Neolithic West Saharan sample from Lower Nubia. Biological continuity was also found intact from the dynastic to the post-Pharaonic periods. According to Irish, the Egyptian samples 996 mummies exhibit morphologically simple, mass-reduced dentitions that are similar to those in populations from Greater North Africa Irish, 1993, 1998AC, 2000 and, to a lesser extent, Western Asia and Europe Turner, 1985A, Turner and Markowitz, 1990, Roller, 1992, Lipschultz, 1996, Irish, 1998A. Similar craniofacial measurements among samples from these regions were reported as well Brace et al., 1993. An inspection of MMD values reveals no evidence of increasing phenetic distance between samples from the first and second halves of this almost 3,000-year-long period. For example, phenetic distances between 1st-2nd dynasty Abydos and samples from 4th dynasty Saqqara MMD 1 quarter 11-12 th dynasty Thebes 12th dynasty Leashed 19th dynasty Kurnay 0.053, and 26th-30th dynasty Giza 0.027 do not exhibit a directional increase through time. Thus, despite increasing foreign influence after the Second Intermediate Period, not only did Egyptian culture remain intact Lloyd, 2000A, but the people themselves, as represented by the dental samples, appear biologically constant as well. Gebel Ram La Neolithic Nubian, Western Desert sample is, in fact, significantly different from Badari based on the 22 trait MMD Table 4. For that matter, the Neolithic Western Desert sample is significantly different from all others but is closest to pre-dynastic and early dynastic samples. See also Saidi people Religion in Egypt List of Egyptians Egyptian Americans Egyptians in the United Kingdom Egyptians in Germany Egyptian diaspora Topic References Topic Bibliography Barakat, Halim 1993 The Arab World Society Culture and State University of California Press ISBN 0520084276
Hinbush, Raymond A. 2002. The Foreign Policies of Middle East States. Lynn Reiner Publishers. ISBN 1588260208. Hinbush, Raymond A. 2007. An Account of the Manners and Customs of the Modern Egyptians, written in Egypt during the years 1833-34, and minus 35, partly from notes made during a former visit to that country in the years 1825, 26-27, and minus 28. Volume 1 of An Account of the Manners and Customs of the Modern Egyptians. C. Knight & Co. Retrieved 6 July 2011.